Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. Hopefully you may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is for the last three months of, De uh, of 2014, the months of October, November, and December. This particular lesson is lesson number four in that series for October 25 of 2014. It's entitled, Being and Doing. Being and doing. What does that have to do with the book of James? Well, we'll find out. Uh, there's a lot of verses in here, and there's some interesting stories in here, some very provocative things to think about. So we, we should start with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father, as we bow before you, we ask that you will guide us to understand the words here, to think about them, to take them to heart, to have our lives be transformed by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. And may that be our experience as a result of our time here today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jean Francois Gravelet, better known as the Great Blondin, became famous for walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. In September of 1860, the Prince of Wales had witnessed Blondin's crossing of the falls with an assistant on his back. And there was no television, not even any radio in those days, so you had to be there to actually witness it. After the walk, Blondin turned to the British prince and offered to carry him across the falls too. Although the prince had heard of the man's skills and had even just seen them in action, he was still not ready to place his life in Blondin's hands. The point is, of course, <laughs> hearing and seeing are not enough when it comes to a relationship. In our case, we're talking about a relationship with God. Do we really believe that God's will is better for us than our own ideas? Yes. If I asked us to all, everybody to raise their, who believes that, hold their hands up, I think probably everybody would. But do we live accordingly? There's a difference between believing it and actually practicing it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another part where you have to figure out if it's really God's will or not. Yes, of And course. figure out if it's his idea or yours. Yes. How do you know, how do you know whether you're go acting on an idea if it's God's or yours? Well, of course, that's why we need to focus on the life of Jesus. You know, that's, and the scriptures. The scriptures is what he's given us to, to know what, has, what his ideas are like. That's exactly what it's there for. And do we believe this statement? This is one that you must have heard many times. It's found in a number of places, but I'm, I'm quoting out of Desire of Ages 224, paragraph 5. God never leads his children. Now, it doesn't say his children never go. They go wherever they want to go. <laughs> but God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. It's our page is 224, paragraph 5. That's providing you have faith to believe that. I'm, I'm just wonder, asking. I wonder if that's what Jonah thought. Good question. <laughs> he didn't seem to be too pleased that they're at the end. You mean Jonah's kind of like the rest of us? Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but, <laughs> I, you know, I just... You know, the Jonah story, there's a lot of details of that story that a lot of people don't recognize. If you go back to Second Kings, Jonah was actually working for the king. This guy had a high-level position. And I'm sure when God spoke to him, well, the second time when he finally decided to go, he, he finally said, well, God really wants me to go there. I'm going to go and I'm going to conquer Nineveh all by myself. I'm going to come back and they're all going to be dead. And he came back and they were all converted. converted. Well, I know, but he still, even at that, he still wasn't, wasn't, couldn't see the glorious end that God had from the beginning, it seems like. And that's a, I'm sorry to bring that confusing illustration into the table. Well, 
And here, here it is, James, James 1, 23 and 24, we're talking about whoever listens to the word but does not put it into practice is like a man who looks in a mirror and sees himself as he is. He takes a good look at himself and then goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. What kind of a deal is that? Someone once said this about his enemy, I see him every day when I'm shaving. You're talking about his whiskers? I don't think he's talking about the whiskers. Okay. Is that why you're growing a beard? <laughs> <laughs> Not that either. <laughs> you don't have to look in the mirror. <laughs> well, do we really recognize this fact? Do we agree with it? I mean, we, we talked last week about the fact that what happens? Our evil desires lead to sin, which leads to death. How many of us want to go there? So we're supposed to look in the mirror and hate what we see in the mirror? I'm asking you. I don't know, because I think part of the part of the thing is that we have to forgive ourselves. Well, remember, and this is a hard thing for selfish human beings to recognize, we can't and we don't do the necessary changing ourselves. How do we get changed to be a part of God's kingdom? Well, what are you talking about changing here? We're saying the only way you can really be changed is to let the Holy Spirit do it. And you do that by focusing on what he's written, what he's inspired people to write, the Bible, well, but, by prayer, but, and by witnessing. But if you aren't changed, <coughs> then you aren't inclined to listen to the Holy Spirit. So there's got to be a change before you get to the changing part. The Holy Spirit, and I'll just take a second on this, the Holy Spirit works at four levels in the lives of everyone who cooperates with them, and even those who don't. The most basic level, He keeps us alive. There's plenty of verses in the Bible. Look especially at Acts 17. Plenty of verses in the Bible say that God is the one that keeps us alive every heartbeat. Then He woos people. He says, please, come back, listen to God. It's for your best good. Then if we do start to respond to him, and now this is what you're talking about, he converts people. He convicts them and he converts them. So you could, they, be, they become Christians, they're baptized, etc. And, and is this the mind part that we were talking about last, last yeah. week? Yeah, yeah. And then finally, if in fact we do come back, he says, good, now I'm going to give you gifts to go out and tell the good news to others. And so that's the the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of people who want to sort of skip over these first steps and go straight to the gifts. And they want to, they want to have God give them gifts so they can do what they think they need to do, what they want to do, not what God wants them to do. So our works are kind of a, a litmus of the Spirit that motivates us. If we do good works, then we are... It's a, it's a, it's a, Jesus kind of said that, didn't he? Something about fruit and trees? Yeah. Well, way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, God said these words, But the Lord said to him, to, this is speaking to Samuel, Pay no attention to how tall and handsome he is. Now this has to something to do with the beard in the, in the mirror, I think. I have rejected him, because I do not judge as people judge. They look at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. In fact, God does not reveal to us all, I mean, even, even personally, God does not reveal to us all our defects at one time or we might become too discouraged. Why, so, why are we so defected? <laughs> oh, no, why are we? <laughs> no, and why do we, we kind of stay on that, that we're defected and we're bad and we're sinful and we're all this? Uh, wouldn't it kind of help us to, to kind of see the good side that God so loves us? I think we should kind of yeah. have both of them. God so loves us that he would even die for one of us and all this and that. Because yeah. if we just keep telling people, we would tell, well, you this and that and the other one. Some people might say, well, what the, well, no, I'm bad and there it is, you know. Mm -hmm. because That's I, why he doesn't yeah. reveal us too, much, too many of our sins all at once. <laughs> <laughs> but think of a couple of examples. Think of Peter who 
on, on, on the night before the crucifixion? Mm -hmm. Think of the rich young, young ruler by contrast. What, what, what was the difference between those two people? I mean, here's Peter. He says, man, Lord, I will die with you. And a little while later, he's cursing and swearing that he doesn't know him. And the rich young ruler, he says, I want your help. Here I am, you know, bless me. And what did Jesus say to him? Get rid Go of and sell everything you have and give to the poor and come back and follow me. Give up the evidence that you're blessed by God. Yes. Hmm. And what was the final result from those two people? Peter realized he needed to change. Peter recognized his problem and said, Lord, so help me, I really do want to be your disciple. And the rich young ruler said, sorry, that's asking too much. But he left sorrowful. But I said, he was sorry. Well, <laughs> I didn't quite point have the emotion. I, I didn't, I didn't write, write the right tone in my voice, right? Well, good. look at James 1, verse 22. Do not deceive yourselves by just listening to his word. Instead, put it into practice. In the King James, it's do not, there's, is there a difference between doing the word and being a doer of the word? Question of depth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Of intent, also. No? It's the Pharisee in his in his nice coloured robes and all this stuff, spouting off as against a simple man with nothing, doing all the miracles and everything. Well, here's a here's a statement that just blows me away. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent. What's, what's our part of the, of the job here? Consent. consent. If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. You know, that's, a, that's very interesting there because the emphasis on what he is going to do mm -hmm what he's going to pour into us. If we consent. consent. Right. The will, refined and sanctified, <clears throat> will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Desire of ages 668, paragraph 3. So Try to imagine that kind of experience. I, I, I know what it's saying there, but uh, let's just say that... You wouldn't that, dare disagree, would you? No, no. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to, trying to think if, if our will becomes like God's will, that means we'll be doing what we want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody turns around and says, that you're selfish, even though you're doing that, well then, um, how are you going to be able to argue with him? I would think if someone makes that kind of a claim, you'd want to ignore him. Well, <laughs> you know, we're, we talk about selfishness all yeah. the time. Yeah. And, um, and if our will turns to, out to be God's will, mm -hmm. and you want to do things a certain way because God wants it that way because you mm -hmm. you really know he does but then the guy disagrees with you and says you shouldn't do it that way you're just being selfish you how do you well, how do you the, deal the, with that the example the example I would turn to is found in 1 Kings 13 where there was a, a young man a prophet from the south who went up to the northern kingdom and condemned what the king was doing up there and the king wanted him to go home and eat with him he didn't and Another prophet came later as the guy was on his way home. He says, come back and have a meal with me. He says, no, I can't do that because God has told me not to. And the old prophet said, oh, but God has told me that you can. Okay, he also we, said he's a prophet, also a prophet of the Lord. I also am a prophet of the Lord. Yeah, that was, yeah exactly. But he lied. But he lied to him. But right. um, So, 
he did the li he just believed the lie. Mm-hmm. So, what does that have to do Might with have been hungry too. <laughs> well, <laughs> well the I mean, snicker. Okay, <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit further down here. We're gonna read some quotations I think are relevant to your point. Okay. But um, well, maybe we just better wait for that. Okay. In Luke six twenty seven to thirty eight, in a sort of a version of the what we call might call the Sermon on the Mount. Luke talks about loving your enemies, giving freely, not retaliating, and being merciful. Are any of those things natural for us as, as human beings? No. Last Sabbath, my son kept asking me after, after a class. Uh, he kept saying, does God still love Satan? If so, why? Why is he merciful to him? He kept, he bothered me so much. I said, you need to, you should have asked uh, Dr. Hart in class. I don't know. <laughs> Um, he kept asking me, and I said, kept, oh, that really kept resonating with him. Mm -hmm. like, oh. Our only safety is in continually focusing on the life and character of Jesus Christ. When we turn our eyes away from him and to ourselves, for whatever reason, we lose. Can you think of a time when you did something because you were required to do so? How was that different from doing something you really wanted to do? Now, um, if you deal with teenagers, it's not too hard to think of an experience like this. Well, the oldest thing I can think of is my parents making me finish my plate. Yes, okay. You're thinking of the starving children on the other side of the world. Yeah, and now I can't, <laughs> can't leave the plate without... <laughs> Does something which comes naturally... Is, doing something which comes naturally is a pleasant task. Doing something that we just are just required to do is never truly pleasant. So, what about that? Now, think about that for a moment. If you want to do it, it's pleasant. If you don't want to do it, it's not pleasant. So, if we knew that certain things were God, what God wants us to do, then if we could learn to want to do them, they would be pleasant, right? If you wanted to do them, they would be pleasant? Yeah. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that true? So, are you coming so up with a formula of how we're going to be happy? I'm, I'm <laughs> suggesting to you, if we could learn to want to do everything God asks us to do, we'd be happy? We would be home free, right? Now, let me ask you this question. Okay. Jesus did the will of the Father to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. But why was he known as the God of Sorrows? Well, because there was other people, uh, particularly the devil, who absolutely wanted to stop to prevent that from happening. Okay, so that may not work all the time, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Most of the time it will? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> here, here, Ellen White puts it very bluntly in these words, and this is a passage that a lot of people don't read either. It's also it's found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, paragraph 3. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely. Now, how many sermons have we heard saying, you need to do this, you've got to do this, this is what's required. Okay? From a sense of obligation merely, because he's required to do so, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. He does it because he thinks he has to. God says that's obedience or not obedience? Not obedience. So to when, the external eye, he does he the right obeyed, thing, right. but it's for the wrong reason? Yep. When the, he thinks he has to. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, what's the contrast here? God's will, human inclination. We may know that the life is not a Christian life. Wow. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. How's uh, that for something to think about? I was just thinking about obligation. Yeah. 
uh, so the Christian life is not a, a thing of obligation? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be? Even if the wages of sin is death? Even so. Well, I mean, what, what, here's, 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 here's what, let me try to put this in distinction. If you say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I've, I've heard of people say, I'm going to practice health reform even if it kills me. You know, that's the, that's the, kind, of, the kind of thing. That, <laughs> that almost happened once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if, if that's our attitude toward keeping God's rules, it, it will never work. On the other hand, if we look at the life of Jesus and we study it and we study it, we say, wow, I like what I see there. I want to be as much like that as I possibly can. Then a lot of the difficulties that the other guy's having won't be there. Because you, this, this guy is saying, I want to be like Jesus. How do we distinguish from what we do out of love for God and what we do that, let's say, you have to follow the law, you have to follow speed limit. And there are countries that, you know, the law and Bible are so interconnected that there are certain things if you do, you get stoned and whatever. You, so how do people really differentiate from the two and understand when, what they're doing something out of love for God and not all just other reasons. Yeah, just and there, there are pastors. God bless them. If you don't want to do what they tell you to do, they say, God requires you to love Him. Right? Yeah. Well, look at James 1.25. But those who look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, is that possible? who keep on paying attention to it and do not simply listen and then forget it, but put it into practice, they will be blessed by God in what they do. What happens? These are people who say, I see why God, I understand why God wants me to do that. And to the best of my ability, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Like we just read in Christ's Optical Lessons, page 97. Those people are the ones who are going to be saved. Do we really believe on a practical level that what God wants us to do is for the best of is, is for our best good? That's a it's so contrary to the thinking of most people. And most people think, well, God has this ideal up here, but boy, it is really hard, you know. You know, how can we ever reach that? And I'm down here and I'm struggling and you know, my way, I want this way, I want that way. Am I ever going to get up here? And back and forth, their thinking goes. Well, do we show that in our lifestyle? That's the question. That's exactly the question. When we choose to sin, what are we really saying? My way. Right now, I want my way instead of God's way. Right? Isn't that what we're saying? Well, look at a couple of passages. Romans 8, I'm going to read verses 2 to 4. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life and union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now we've got two laws dealing with here. What the law could not do, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin and human nature by sending His own Son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Or... To, if you wanted to put it in shorter terms, to deal with sin. God did this so that the righteous demands of the law might be fully satisfied in us who live according to the Spirit and not according to human nature. What's he saying? We live according to the Spirit instead of human nature. We're supposed to. Well, you know, we are a temple, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, if there's nothing worse than a temple, temple that's empty of its God, yeah. Um, I think a lot of this description is a is a description of a temple that's empty of God. Yes. So if God is with you and He's in your temple, He's He's sitting on your throne in your temple. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that kind of affect? who we are and what we're going to do? Yeah, it, it does. So, okay, well, let's, let's, my computer right now is giving me a problem. Give me just a second here to 
See if I can recover here. Um, what what what's the problem here in our in our individual indi individual experience? Why do we have so much trouble with this? Me. Hey. Well, that's a hard question. Uh, There's lots of hard questions in these lessons. Maybe a big question would be is. Most of us here are experienced in the Christian life for many years. Why don't we have the answer? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, it's uh, also like we talked about last week um, about the uh, alcoholic who passes the bar and decides not to go, but still might long to be there. And years and years might go by, but he still has that longing, although he knows it's wrong. And sin can be the same way. I mean, we abuse abuse it often. And uh, we use God's kindness to try to you know, crawl back and say, yeah. how are we going to, let's, let's give it one more shot. We've Un changed this time. Yeah. Unfortunately, so many Christians think that they can go ahead living their sinful lives and just thankful that God forgives me. I'm so thankful that God forgives me. I'm so thankful that God forgives me. Yeah, we're thankful, but, you know, couldn't we maybe pick a different tune after a while? Well, you know, part of it, I think, is uh, people, they, they go back into a particular sin or whatever it is. They're trying to meet some need. It would appear to me, I mean, people just don't go off and, good people just don't go off and say, well, I'm going to be mean for a while. Mm -hmm. there's, 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 there's some kind of a need uh, that they feel whatever it is that they're doing is going to, and, and it's, I think it's a whole lot easier to say it that way than it is maybe to really identify it or, or whatever, but it, it would seem to be that that would be the primary impulse of why someone would, I'm going to be using the bar again here, but well, there's something about that that seems to satisfy something that may not, they may not even know what they're longing for. Well, you might be thinking that there's, they're sold on the wrong solution. They're, they're, they're in need of something, like you say, mm -hmm. but maybe the problem is that they're sold on the wrong solution. Or it's an easy way to, to you know, I were really getting into behavioral stuff here, and I'm not a behaviorist, mm -hmm. but... It, it's, it's, people do they like to do what they want to do. So if we could make, if, if we could figure out a way to want to do what's right, we would be home free, right? Well, sometimes I think uh, we don't go to, uh, and I'm probably reflecting certain on my own thoughts here, but... Um, <laughs> There's no law against that. Got to be careful here over international broadcast. I don't... Uh, <laughs> make any serious confessions here, but you know, sometimes I think um, if we're smart enough in the Christian experience, we know if we go and if, if we if we need to make some changes here, we know those changes that are going to. We know God, and He's going to He's going to want us to do something, some things that we just don't particularly want to do. There you go. That's the problem. <laughs> and uh, other times we don't realize that, but you know. If I come out of my little hole here, my little, oh my goodness, now I'm going to have to do all of this stuff that I really don't want to do. I don't want to, whatever it is. I'd rather stay in bed on Sabbath morning. <laughs> you mean something like that? Well, well, what about prison ministry? Yeah. Um, you know, if there's anything that the Bible talks about, Old and New Testament, be kind to the father, the homeless, or the fathers and the widows, and visit people in the prison. Well, I think about that. I don't know if I want to go over and visit people in prison. I don't know if I'd have anything to say. And, you know, what am I supposed to do when I get there? there? And there. it takes a lot of time to do it. You develop a relationship and you got to keep going back and all of that stuff. Yeah. You can't just leave these people high and dry here. That's right. So, you know, it's a lot of commitment here when you start. Am I the well, only one that thinks that way? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, no, you aren't the only one that thinks that way. You're, you're doing a great job. But the point, the point is, God is asking us to commit to that kind of a life for the rest of eternity. 
when we get to heaven, it's not going to be sitting back and let other people take care of us, you know, meet all our needs. God will meet our needs, but we will be there to serve others. You know, sometimes I, one of the things that really bothers me is, is uh, homeless children mm -hmm. or homeless, you know, that really bothers me and it's my understanding just three or four miles away over here in San Bernardino we have maybe thousands. I mean, those are the numbers that I that we hear about. There's thousands over there, at least a thousand or so. And I think, well, now let's see, what in the world would I do about that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think if I explore that, uh, my goodness, that's going to be, that could eventually get to be a big thing. And I've got other things I'd rather do. So, and that's not the only thing. There's lots of things like that. So, now am I, am I, Am I, um, am I uh, not doing the right thing here? Or, you know, that, uh, this, this putting up with sin business and, and trying to change your ways, it, it's a, you're opening doors that go down all kinds of hallways you may not want to go down. So is that, is that part of why we, we... It's absolutely part. Well, since the days of Martin Luther, Christians have tended to think that Paul emphasizes faith while James emphasizes works. Is that what we're talking about here? No, they're both saying the same thing, actually. Paul says, Romans 2, 13, For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. Doesn't that sound like the straight out of James? <coughs> Well, for many of us, it may be true that someday in heaven, we will begin to realize the full impact of these words. And hopefully, we will be able to go up to God, give Him a big hug, and say, Now I understand why you asked us to do all those things. Now I do them because I want to, and because they are the right things to do. Think that could happen? Are we truly ready to recognize that God's will for our lives is better than our own will for our lives? Is there, is, do, when you do something really good for somebody else, is there any reward in that? Well, well evident, evidently not if you're, if you're not doing, doing it because you want to, you feel well, like you let's, have let's to. Let's say once in a while you really want to, then what happens? I think you get a feeling of satisfaction. Sure. You know, I think, I think we're kind of limiting this helping other people to some stuff that we don't want to do. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we do to help people that we do like to do. Okay. Just even business. Mm -hmm. When you give a person a good product and your stuff really works well and they're really happy about it, that, that helps you inside. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you give a person a fair deal, well, that, that helps you too. It's all doing things for your neighbor. Um, focusing on doing the dishes for for s somebody in the soup kitchen, well, you know, that's that's good, but that's only a small part of it. Yeah. You know? Is it really possible that the laws of God are the laws of freedom? Um, we already read one verse. Let me read a couple more. Look at John 8, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, then you will be really free. John 13, 34 and 35, and I quote, And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Does that sound like freedom? L look at John 15, 12. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. Is this freedom from or freedom to? Well, that's the question. Everyone who gets to heaven will be able to do whatever he wants, he or she wants to do at all times simply because, what? You want to do the right thing. He or she will never want to do anything wrong. W would it be a bad thing to start practicing that now? <laughs> oh, I laugh because, <laughs> I mean, you may want to, but you don't you may not be able to do it consistently. 
Well, we yeah, is that, is, that, is that really I said possible? Practice. Yeah. I said practice. I didn't say do it all. Yeah. We got in the, I wasn't here when we were, you, were talk, you guys were talking about the drunk and the boy and what have you. Uh, when the drunk decide not to go in the boy, so he's enduring until he overcomes. Mm -hmm. Be, yeah, he does endure because there's also a physiological thing going on too because someone who's addicted yeah. to a substance feels something and they're so afraid to feel what they're feeling, they go ahead and do it. So there's so many things, and their mind is not working right. There's so many things involved. That's, uh, that's why a lot of people who leave those kind of things, it is through God and God alone. It's not just, yeah. Talk, talk, to, you, talk to the people who are going through the 12-step program. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Yeah. Not easy. Uh, Pastor Larry, he's not, Pastor Christopher, you might know him. Like, well, uh, it had a 12-step program, and it was the saddest thing. And the people were Seventh-day Adventists, and all the people too would just walk in, and their stories were so awful. And after a few weeks, you would see people change. People were in recovery, regular recovery, with the Bible and the Bible alone. You would sit and talk to somebody. You would see grown men just cry, and they would change. You see them weeks later, they yeah. dressed up. They went, they got a job. They do it. It's just fantastic to just see mm, what God can do. Well, James, yeah. near the end of chapter 1, lays, it down, lays down the law. <coughs> Verse 26 and 27. Do any of you think you're religious? I won't, ask to, I won't ask you to raise your hand right now. If you do not control your tongue, your religion is worthless, and you deceive yourselves. Oh God, I'm done for. <laughs> <laughs> what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering, and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. Okay? How many of us are doing that? Well, Jesus said essentially the th same thing in Matthew 25. Remember where the, he separates the sheep from the goats? What's the difference? Actions. Actions. Someone, you did, th did it to the least of these, my brethren, remember? Paul said it in, in Romans 12. You remember what that is? Love must be completely sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another warmly as Christian brothers and sisters, and so forth. True Christianity, developed through faith, will produce the results they were talking about. And boy, this ought to blow the socks off of us. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 400, 470, paragraph 1, and repeated in a number of other places. But she goes on in the next paragraph, but to live such a life, to exert such an influence, costs at every step effort, self-sacrifice, and discipline. Why is that? Why is it? I mean, Jay's asked this question <laughs> that, in various ways. Thank you, Jay. There just went all the fun and everything. <laughs> well, all that, that self-sacrifice and of, discipline. A, and a lot of people would think so. <coughs> what is it no, talking is, Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, there is, um, when you listed those things out there, there's still a motivation that needs to be there to do those things. Mm -hmm. And that's what comes from the Lord. So if you try to do that without the Lord... You're going to fall flat on your face. Yeah. I mean, we've got to remember that. Uh, I mean, you could read that and then go out the door and think, man, I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then fall flat on your face. But it's, it's the Lord's power that helps you do those things. Yep. We've got in self-sacrifice. So I think some people get it wrong. Does it mean we sit with suffering? sackcloth and ashes, ashes and beat ourselves and flag us. It doesn't mean all of that. So what exactly? God is telling us that to do the loving thing will ultimately be the, bring the greatest joy. And that's hard for us to believe. I mean, we are born absolutely selfish. I mean, and, and, and little babies, it's, a, it's almost a self-preservation. That's how they get yeah. what they need. They, they let everybody know. Myra, I think you c could testify <laughs> to that. Just having visited a couple of grandchildren. 
That's how they get, they get what they need. But at some point, we need to say, okay, I don't need to be an infant any longer. I, I don't need to, you know, just uh, think only about me. And we need to start thinking about other people. And that is very hard. So, Gordon, you're a pretty nice guy. Is it all this hard? Is it really all that hard? Are they what to are be you a good going through all this sacrifice <laughs> and and all this endurance and all of that? Is it? Is it do, do, and, and, and let's let me, have a little testimony. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me come back. To, <laughs> let me come back to Myra. Myra has been a mother, and now she's a grandmother. <laughs> do you feel bad about doing things? Do you feel bad about changing a diaper? No. <laughs> And I have to say, I can think of many times where I've stood and watched my children eat the dessert I wanted because there wasn't enough for everybody. Okay. You know, but I was more than happy for them to have it. That's you do it because because you love them. Yeah. Was that good for them to have that dessert? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't dessert. Okay. So when I went when, she, when she, we're talking about the sacrifice, that that's the sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's no big sacrifice. <laughs> okay, then it's easy to be a Christian. <laughs> so, you know, when you read that sacrifice and all those other terrible words in there, it seems like a, oh, what? a whole lot, a whole lot stronger well, think, language than. Think what, about uh, you know, Think about the problem. mother. Well, go ahead. Oh, no, I made a joke. <laughs> well, think, think about the mothers. I mean, I see them all the time. Think about the mothers with little tiny babies. Their whole lives almost are dedicated to caring for those little babies. Do they think it's a sacrifice? Well, I can tell you that yesterday I spent quite a bit of time going through a whole bunch of legal stuff, that, the medical legal stuff that I had to do for a couple that were about 80 years old. And why was I doing that? They were adopting their 10-year-old granddaughter oh that they had been caring for since she was one month old mother who was on drugs mm. showed up at their house and said here mm. 80 years old that's wrong <laughs> 80 oh. years old well after being with my grandchildren yes. i will say that the mothers of both of those grandchildren have lacked a lot of sleep lately mm -hmm. and neither of them would say it was a sacrifice yeah I didn't think about oh, that. I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing, I don't know about the sacrifice, though, because sometimes the baby would start crying and all of a sudden somebody would shake my arm. It's <laughs> 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 your, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but look at this now. We're talking about love and action here. Mother's love and action. And I quote from Luke 6.35. Do we believe these words? No. Love your enemies and do good to them. Lend and expect nothing back. You will then have a great reward and you will be children of the Most High God for he is good to the grateful, good to the ungrateful and the wicked. Is that possible? I think so. Is that possible in our communities? Loma Linda, San Bernardino, Redlands, Grand Terrace, Yucaipa, Riverside. Depends what kind of giving you're referring to. Okay. Are there some kinds of giving that are good and sometimes the giving that we can't manage? I read an article of a local paper just the other day. It's brought it home to me. And I, I think superficially we might realize it, but it pointed out that in summertime in the school holidays with the public schools, there are thousands of kids in this general area that get no food mm -hmm. To eat because their main food is breakfast at school. Yeah. Free lunch. They when you lunch. see the figures, it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. boy, oh boy. Yeah, wow. Well, I can tell you that uh, the clinic where I work, we feed thousands of people every week. Yeah. We feed, I mean, it's not our, I mean, it's a cooperation we have with a group of churches that come and bring right. the food and distribute right. the food. And, but it's done right next to where I work. Well, now let's get to the tough stuff. James, well, as if we haven't not tough enough already. <laughs> James went on to say we must keep ourselves unspotted from the world, if I'm using the old King James. <clears throat> Is that possible? Well, John said basically the same thing. Peter said the same thing. 
Look at Peter's word, 2 Peter 1, verse 4. In this way he has given us the very great and precious gifts he promised, so that by means of these gifts you may escape from the destructive lust that is in the world and may come to share the divine nature. To escape this destructive lust that's in the world and come to share the divine nature. How's that for a transformation? Looking at the world around us, is it really possible to, to keep yourself from being corrupted by the world around us? I mean, the television, the, the advertisement, I mean, there is every kind of attraction. I mean, Hollywood and, I don't know, Mattis Avenue, whoever does all those ad stuff, I mean, they have thought of every device you can possibly imagine to try to attract people in mostly bad ways to get you to buy a product or whatever it happens, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the atmosphere in which we hope to live in heaven is one of pure... I'm sorry, let me go back here. The atmosphere in which we hope to live in heaven is one of pure unselfishness. Do we believe that? In heaven, where we live in a place that's purely unselfish, everyone will be totally loving. How do we become like that? Well, with this truth, Christ connects the lesson of self-sacrifice that all should learn. I'm reading now from uh, Ellen White's writings once again, and this is Desire of Ages, 623, paragraph 5. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. All who would bring forth fruit as workers together with Christ must first fall into the ground and die. The life must be cast into the furrow of the world's need. Self-love, <coughs> self-interest must perish. And the law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. How can that be? The husbandman preserves his grain by casting it away. So in human life, I mean, how does he cast it away? He goes out there in the field and he whoosh, right? The life that will be preserved is a life that is freely given in service to God and man. Those who for Christ's sake sacrifice their life in this world will keep it unto eternal life. Desire of Ages 623. Wow. And Christ taught you lessons also. Some think that it is impossible to keep oneself unspotted from the world while being surrounded by the world in which we live. The secret is not moving away from all other human beings, although that may be helpful in some ways in resi resisting sin. But the true battle comes from where? We can't run from ourselves. Inside. The closer you come to Jesus, and here's Gary in response to some things you said earlier, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clear and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Steps to Christ, page 64, paragraph 2. Now, let's not misunderstand what Ellen White is saying here. She was not saying that the closer we get to Jesus, the faultier we will actually become. She continued to say... <coughs> The more our sense of need drives us to him and to the word of God, the more exalted views we shall have of his character and the more fully we shall reflect his image. Steps to Christ 65, verse 2. In other words, as we come closer and closer to Jesus, it's like coming closer and closer to the light. I went running very early this morning and I tried to do it without any light of any kind. I was hoping there was enough the moon's full and so forth. But I couldn't see very many of the rough spots on the road. And fortunately, I, I was pretty aware of where I had to run until the sun started coming up a little bit more. <coughs> you know, you're running in the dark, you're in, you got to, it's dangerous. Well, Jesus described that in Matthew 5, verse 6. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them per fully. What, what is the condition of these people? Happy. The, the King James says blessed, but the word really means happy. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. How do we de develop that kind of an attitude? Do 
Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> you mean no, the, the desire that Christ <coughs> wants? <coughs> yeah, well, he, this is Sermon on the Mount. This is his premier sermon. Here it is, Matthew 5. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Well, Gordon, I'm going to pick on you again. And I'll okay. ignore you again. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it largely your happiest desire to do, to make your wife happy? Oh, my goodness, he's pausing. <laughs> that is very important. <laughs> I'm waiting to hear what he's saying. <laughs> the wrong... And the grandkids. Wrong question. I feel that one. I guess what I, where I was trying to lead with, a, with, a, with an immediate example here, <laughs> and I don't think we should interpret from Gordon's pause for thought there. That's, that's <laughs> any reservations? Looking for just the, the way right word. perfect the answer. <laughs> Um, but it's you know it's it's a relationship with this yeah. with this and when you when you uh, when you develop that relationship you you just I, it's diff you know it's really you can put it in human words but it's difficult to really even explain. Do you remember the story in John four where Jesus met the woman at the, at the well in Samaria? He said it gave, gave him such joy to speak the truth to people and to convert them to Christianity that he would rather do that than eat. Fortunately, everybody in this room was fairly slim and trim, but <laughs> the people I deal with every day are not that way. Well, if we follow this plan for our lives, and now I quote from Steps to Christ, page 57, a change will be seen in the character, the habits and the pursuits. The contrast will be clear and decided between what they have been and what they are. You, you talked about that, the 12-step program. The character is revealed, and here's some words of encouragement. We needed to finish with some words of encouragement, right? <laughs> the character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. Which way are we headed, up or down? Christ, steps to Christ, page 60. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. So in other words, the only way to really obey is to come to understand Jesus fully and to, to follow his example until we say, hey, you know, that's the right thing to do. I like that. As Jesus was, I'm reading on now, Our Father Cares, page 69. As Jesus was in human nature, so God means his followers to be. In his strength, we are to live the life of purity and nobility which the Savior lived. Wow. And a story from our lesson as we finish up from our Bible study guide. Police were trying, this is from the teacher's Bible study guide. Police were trying to place electronic eavesdropping devices in an office where they suspected criminals were working. The only problem, vicious Dobermans surrounded the compound. So the police each night would feed the dogs hamburgers. At first they would toss about four, six, five or six between the bars. Before long, the dogs were not only eating the burgers out of the officers' hands, but they were licking the officers' uh, hands um, but they were licking the officer's hands when done. Thus, with the guard dogs tamed, the police were able to infiltrate and plant the devices. What lesson can we take from this story about how we can, um, how we, if we are not careful, can let our own guards down? Are we prepared, and here's what the lesson wants us to recognize. Are we prepared to, one, recognize that the root of temptation comes from our own lessons and lusts and desires? Two, discern that God's ways are better for us than our own natural ways. And three, admit that in our own power it is impossible to resist temptation, but with God all things are possible. Are we prepared to experience God's power in our lives? 
Have you experienced the joy of actually being able to conquer some of your natural evil tendencies in God's power? James 1.21 suggests that it is only by having God's Word implanted in our hearts that we can successfully live the Christian life. Is that true? Well, we've suggested faith is the key to God's plan of salvation. He will transform us and our behaviors will demonstrate what God has done in our lives. Those behaviors will be, basis, will be the basis on which God carries out his final judgment. And you know that stuff all the way through the Bible. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, 13 and 14. Matthew 16, 27. 1 Peter 1, 17. Revelation 20, 12 and 22, 12. So James is not so far off, is he? <laughs> a lot of other Bible writers agree with him. And now a final word from Ellen White. It is not possible for us to drift into heaven. Those who refuse to cooperate with God on earth would not cooperate with him in heaven. It would not be safe to take them to heaven. Christ obviously lets us page 280. Many of you will remember Dr. Maxwell. He used to talk about people who were safe to save. And I didn't know I would find that he, right here in Ellen White's writings. There are people who think that we can legally demand our right to enter heaven. Some of us have heard him say so. But this says it's only safe to take people to heaven who really want to do what's right. In the past, Seventh-day Adventists have often been characterized as hopelessly legalists. Hopeless legalists. In our day, some seem to have gone to the opposite extreme and do not even want to talk about keeping the law. Do we really believe that it is a law of liberty, a law that sets people free? So where are we on that spectrum? Legalists? Lax. We have to recognize that, as Paul said in Romans 6, verse 6, as long as we allow our natural human selfishness to rule, we will not make progress. The old man must be crucified. Are we really, are we ready to allow God to make those necessary changes in our lives? What does it mean to be a crucified Christian? Does it mean to be a loving Christian? It's your call.